Hi, my name is Johnny Gartner, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Season 2 of the Cedar 60 Podcast. At Cedar 60, our mission is to engage with culture and politics from the distinctive lens of the gospel. Today, we are excited to have Dr. Mark Caleb Smith on the podcast as we do just that and discuss voting rights in America. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for being with us today. It is my pleasure, seriously. I, uh, I always enjoy I always enjoy being on podcasts and enjoy being with you all in particular. Well, we appreciate it. We have a very distinctive mission, and uh, you're very helpful towards helping us make that possible. So thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, so voting rights, kind of a really hot topic right now. At least it was like a week ago. Not mm-hmm. as much right now, but it's still right. in the right. works. Right. Um, but before we get to that, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what you do at Cedarville and kind of what makes you qualified to talk on this issue. I know that's kind of a weird uh, question uh, to no, ask, but I kind mean, of want to set I'm that sure up. I'm sure some people would argue if I'm qualified, depending on what you how you define that term. But uh, I am a professor of political science here at Cedarville. I'm also the chair of the Department of History and Government. Uh, also the director of the Center for Political Studies at Cedarville, so I wear a lot of hats. Um, I have a PhD in American politics. It's political science, but my focus is American politics from the University of Georgia, uh, master's in political science as well. I've been teaching these kinds of things for uh, about almost 20 years now total. So i uh, published on campaigns and elections and all sorts of things, and so I enjoy what I do. Voting is certainly a big part of what I do. I think history is also probably sure. a really important yeah. thing about what you For do. Sure. So yeah. uh, there's a really important historical aspect to voting rights in America, talking about civil rights movement, suffrage. Right. So if we could kind of talk about maybe you know the effort of voting in the Constitution up through the civil rights suffrage movement, um, just as a brief history so uh, viewers have an understanding of what sure. we're talking about. Yeah, brief is an interesting brief. word when it comes to history. Yes, it yeah. is. Uh, the Constitution does not say a lot about voting, right? When you yep. look at the original Constitution and the Bill of Rights, there's no explicit protection for voting at all. It says that uh, federal elections will happen in states. It gives states in Article One a lot of latitude to deal with those elections as they see fit. They can choose the time, place, and manner of those elections, as the Constitution says. But it does give Congress the ability to make exceptions if Congress chooses to. So there's not a lot of overt protection. So that meant early in our history, voting was primarily, not exclusively, primarily done uh, by white men and mostly landowners and fairly prominent members of their community. I think some of us have sort of a Pollyanna view of American history sometimes. And we think, you know, we were all about political freedom. Well, we were, but we had a fairly restricted view of political freedom Mm. compared to what we think today. So not a broad-based protection. Now, i got to be clear, though. You have to put them in their context. In context, radically free compared to virtually every other country on the face of the earth, right? So more people voting here than in Great Britain at that time, for example. And so you have a big pool of voters, comparatively speaking, but still a relatively smaller pool than what we'd expect from today's perspective. And as you know, Johnny, I mean, part of that stems from the founders, and they were not really thrilled with the idea of democracy per se, right? Mm. They didn't form our government so that everyone would have input. They formed it so that public opinion would be stymied at different points in the process. And so from their perspective, giving a universal right to vote would have been a little bizarre. Yeah, They they weren't necessarily interested in that. Now, that doesn't mean they were interested in discriminating against everyone. There certainly were states that protected voting rights more broadly. Some states had African-Americans that could vote, for example, if they were freed. And so it was a little bit of an uneven process, but generally less free to vote, uh, certainly, than than comes later. Yeah. You talked about that Pollyanna view of American history. I think the historian John Lucas once said that history is a certain kind of memory organized and supported by evidence. And I think... Often people have a different memory of history that's not supported by evidence and kind of supported by the media and the culture surrounding history. And I think it's really important to look at history for what it was because that really affects, you know, what we're talking about today. Um, But yesterday started off Black History Month and the civil rights movement was a really important advancement in voting rights in America. So if you could talk a little bit about the post-Civil War development of voting rights as it moved up through the beginning and middle of the 20th century. Sure. So we really start with the Civil War amendments to the Constitution that ban slavery, uh, that require the equal protection of the laws throughout the states, and then, of course, that protect voting rights based on previous conditions of servitude. So African-American men had a pretty broad right to vote after the 15th Amendment was, was, was passed. 
course, those of you that know your history, Reconstruction, after the Civil War, we have this 12-year period where the South is basically an occupied territory uh, where there's significant federal pressure. African Americans enjoyed a really broad right to vote in the South during Reconstruction. I know most people probably don't understand that or believe it necessarily. Uh, at one point, Mississippi had two African American United States senators. We have a lot of African Americans being elected to Congress and the House at that point. And so um, when you look at voting rates, and they did measure voting rates during Reconstruction, African Americans were voting at roughly equivalent rates to whites wow. in the South during Reconstruction. Yeah. Reconstruction ends in 1877, and everything after about a decade of contention to some extent, southern states begin to restrict voting rights for African Americans. So that in the late 1880s through the 1890s, we start to see pretty significant restrictions take place. Things like poll taxes, literacy tests, white primaries, which probably most people aren't familiar with. So you have a primary election where only whites can vote but you have a general election where everyone can vote. Mm. And so the primary is where the action happens, of course. And so it's just another way to discriminate. And so mm -hmm. there was a pretty extensive set of discriminatory policies in the South, most of them uh, either written into constitutions or through state law. And so this isn't just informal, it isn't just casual, it isn't just cultural, it's a legal regime that restricted African-American voting rights to the point where we get early into the 20th century, uh, 19 teens and 20s, African-Americans are voting at extraordinarily low rates mm -hmm. in the South. And so over a generation, they go from being roughly equivalent to virtually not voting in the South. And so the civil rights movement was really a response to that, yeah. as you can imagine, right? So they're in this legal position where they don't have strong rights, they can't be politically active. And so uh, the, the civil rights movement, starting in the 30s and up through the 1960s, uh, did an incredible amount of work in securing voting rights. And ultimately, of course, this uh, ends with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, mm -hmm. which is a broad set of protections. Uh, we end up with the abolition of the poll tax. We end up with the abolition of literacy tests in most cases. Um, and we have now pretty broadly protected. Now, me, even me saying that, some people will find controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think right now we have really broadly protected voting rights, uh, regardless of race. Yeah. You talked about Reconstruction. I think it's hard to for anyone who studies history to say that Reconstruction was, uh, you know, 100 percent a success because it was, mm. you know, a lot of failure in the efforts to, you know, support African-Americans rights in post-Civil War South America. Um, but I think it, you know, is evidenced by that, that Tim Scott was the first African-American yes. elected to the Senate from the South since Reconstruction. Which, yes. I mean, well, until 2020 when it, Warnock was elected in Georgia, which is just blows your mind. It, 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 is, it is a historical fact that most people cannot fathom or swallow. I know. And when they want to argue that we haven't had a history or a dramatic history of civil rights uh, intimidation or restrictions yeah. since slavery, it just flies in the face of a lot of evidence. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we could spend a whole sure, two, course. three years yeah. talking yes, about no civil rights in America yeah. and the, you know, the rise of the Republican Party in the South and you know, the yeah. end of slavery yep. and all that stuff. Yep. So, but well, you talked about the civil or the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Sure. The most recent date that was authorized was by President George W. Bush in 2006. Right. It's kind of the center of some of the arguments happening today. A lot of Republicans are saying, listen, there was bipartisan support for that bill in 2006. It doesn't expire again until 2030-something. Right. So let's, you know, get a broad coalition of support for voting rights that we, you know, vote on. Right. Um, but there's three bills, you know, that Democrats are proposing right now, the For the People Act, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and the Freedom to Vote Act. If you could talk a little bit about what they're trying to do. And then uh, talk about why there's so much, you know, adamant support by the Republican Party, including two fairly centrist Democrats that have become kind of the central focal point in this argument. So there's a whole lot there, yeah. right? And as you said, we could talk for hours yeah. about any parts of this, but uh, and I, you have to be careful. Uh, I think that the the assertion, not that you made it, but the assertion uh -huh. that those bills in front of Congress right now are somehow equivalent to the Voting Rights Act or are securing voting rights mm -hmm. in a historic way, or that voting rights are in jeopardy yeah. right now, unless those acts are passed, I find that assertion to be difficult to maintain. I yeah. think it's I think it's simply, it borders on false. Well, I'm not sure I'd quite say false, but it's close to being just yeah. false. Um, I mean, I think, you know, that's easy for people to see having watched 
the entirety of the 2016 uh, election where Hillary Clinton talked about Russian right. collusion and the of entirety course. of the 2020 election Correct. where Donald Trump talked about, you know, st- both are, you know, fairly equal cases where people are trying to, you know, tear down right. the integrity of the election right. system. So it's not a like not not an issue that's no, terribly and grammatically correct it, but it's an issue yeah but it, it isn't it isn't as if african-american voting rights are dangling by a thread yeah. that's not true yeah. uh it's also um it is true that states however are acting in response to 2020 um trying to curtail opportunities to vote now someone listening who maybe is a little bit more cynical would say oh that's nice that's delicate language curtail opportunities to vote that sounds like restrictions of voting rights well what we're talking about is restrictions on things like how much early voting takes place, mm-hmm. right? Uh, is it mandatory that states have to have a certain number of days of early voting? How much absentee ballots, how many of those are going to be sent out? What kind of uh, identification is going to be required to vote? Are you going to have drop boxes available? We're talking about those kinds of issues. We're not talking about, honestly, significant movements to try to restrict voting rights mm-hmm. in a meaningful way. And so those bills are aimed at trying to have uh, uniform standards on those issues uh, primarily so that state legislatures have a little less latitude to discriminate when it comes to early voting, absentee vo- voting, and access to certain kinds of voting. Would you call those limitations inherently constitutional arguments or more political arguments? Because it seems like you know the Constitution guarantees a right to vote. But as you were talking about earlier, not right. necessarily right. in very it, it, broad terms. So, it guarantees the equal protection of the law, right? right? So it prevents states from discriminating uh, on the basis of race, even when it comes to voting rights, for sure. Right. And the 15th Amendment, of course, guarantees an absence of discrimination. The Voting Rights Act gets rolled right. into that. And so this is a legal argument. It's a constitutional argument, for sure. Um, but I don't think, you know, when Georgia tries to prevent a campaign from handing out water or food a certain distance from a polling place. Yeah. And then Georgia tries to restrict that. Right. I don't think I would call that a constitutional issue personally. Right. Yeah. And so uh, that's a political question. It's a, it's a pertinent question. It's important. It should be discussed. It should be voted on. Yeah. And we could have different arguments about that, but it's hard for me to see that as like a violation of the constitution. Right. And so, and to an extent, that's kind of where we are. Um, important matters. I, I'll, to be fair, again, I would say, too, we would be fooling ourselves if we think the Republicans in those states weren't trying to limit, at some level, certain kinds of voting. There's a little of bit course. of that going on, right? And so there's some effort for Republicans to kind of, at the margins, make voting a little bit more challenging in very particular ways. Yeah. And you could argue maybe that that's un-American, that it's undemocratic. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, that's a good argument to have. Yeah. So I'm not arguing that the Republicans are interested in, in enlarging voting rights. That's not certainly not the case. Uh, but I think what they're doing is still pretty marginal and pretty minimal. Yeah. Republicans at the state level. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think at the state level, President one of President Obama's big things was gerrymandering. Correct. Where, yeah. Know, state legislators right. right. redistrict yeah. congressional maps to favor their party over the other, which is still an issue. Ohio's no Supreme Court just stuck de- <laughs> struck down, yes. you know, Ohio's yes. proposed uh you know, uh, electoral map. Right. So briefly, what's the argument there? What's that have to do with these bills also? I mean, to some extent, uh, we're all just kind of deluding ourselves if we don't understand that gerrymandering is probably the most important of all these issues, because it does mean that state legislatures, Republicans in places like Ohio, Democrats in places like California Mm -hmm. or New York, can draw their congressional districts, can draw their state legislative districts in a way that favor, tremendously favor, the party that's in power. Yeah. Uh, and they do it. They all do it. And it's created a lot of imbalance in our political system. Mm-hmm. So in a place like Ohio, you know, where Democrats could be expected to win 40 to 45 percent of the statewide vote, yeah. they're going to end up with three out of however many congressional seats. Yeah. And you're like, OK, something is not quite right about yeah. that, right? Uh, in California... Um, you know, Republicans might get 30 to 35 percent of a statewide vote. They're going to end up with just a tiny fraction of congressional yep. seats. And so that out of that out of kilter reality, I think, is really driving a lot of our problems. Yep. Um, the Democrats would like to fix that to some extent. Um, and I'm in favor of fixing it. I'm not sure their proposals would fix anything. Yep. They're talking about pushing this toward sort of nonpartisan voting commissions or, or re- redistricting commissions in states. And I think it, at a superficial level, that's a great idea. But when we've seen these commissions function, they often draw maps that look a lot like legislative efforts to draw maps. And so 
Um, state legislatures have a lot of latitude to deal with this how they wish, as long as they don't do it obviously discriminatory on the basis of race primarily. Um, and so it's, it's a huge problem, yeah. and I don't think you can minimize it. But I don't know if what I'm seeing in these voting bills would really fix that problem all that significantly. Yeah. One other you know, really hot button issue is the filibuster. And yes. For uh, right. people who don't enjoy studying parliamentary procedure in Congress or don't understand how the rule even came to be, there's a lot of confusion as to why it matters. And there's some narratives by both parties that may not necessarily <laughs> be true about its existence. You don't say. Yeah. 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 So if you could quickly talk about and, you know, then there's, you know, sure. co- you know, Senate leaders. Yes. You know, abolishing it in certain circumstances. Correct. I think Harry Reid got rid of it for yep. a Supreme Court nominations for called ju- the nuclear option. For judicial nominations. For judicial and nominations. then McConnell came and did a re- got rid of it for yeah. Supreme Court. That's correct. Yeah yeah. 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 So, I mean, there's just so much history with the filibuster, too. But, you know, quickly, what is it? What does it do? Where are its sure. origins from? Yeah. And why is it so relevant right now? Yeah. Um, the filibuster, the word me is a Dutch word that means to pirate which is an accurate description of, I think, what the filibuster (laughs) does, right? The filibuster is an effort to sort of hijack a legislative process so that one person can get control of the floor, potentially, and speak for as long as they wish, or they could trade that off to other people who agree with them and they could hold the floor for as long as they want to. And so the purpose of it is really to protect an individual legislator's right to speak. And I think we would all agree that's probably pretty valuable, right? To give an individual member yep. the ability to talk about an issue because they care deeply about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why it was written in there to make the, especially the Senate, to be um, deliberate, to be mm-hmm. slow, to give all of them an opportunity to weigh in on legislation. And so, in that sense, I can see the origins of it. It's not in the Constitution, right? Mm-hmm. There's no constitutional yep. protection for the filibuster, it is a Senate rule that they put in place. It's had different levels throughout our history of how you break it or what that looks like. Essentially, you need 60 votes in the Senate to break a filibuster. And so legislation moving through the Senate to be sort of seamless needs that 60 vote threshold. Mm -hmm. Um, The filibuster's changed a lot over the years, right? Very rarely now do we see someone commandeering the floor and talking for a long time. Now they mostly just threaten to filibuster and that sort of short circuits the whole process and they sort of move on. Um, and so there are various proposals that are sent out there. What do we do? Do we change it? Do we abolish it? Um, just a few years ago, as you know, uh, President Obama, then Senator Obama, waxed eloquent about the importance of the filibuster and why we should maintain the filibuster and why we don't want the Senate to just break into this bitter partisanship, which the filibuster tries to prevent. Right. But of course, now President Obama is calling the filibuster the tool of the Jim Crow South yeah. that's used to, to drive down uh, voting rights for African Americans. I mean, that's the favorite talking point of the administration. It is. Right now, so. It is. And so, uh, Democrats have used the filibuster within the last few weeks, yep. dealing with other sets of issues. And so, <clears throat> it's you know, no party in this issue has clean hands. Yep. They've all been on all sides of it. They use it as a political tool. Yep. Um, I think the filibuster is a necessity. I think it's good for the Senate to be sort of that sixty vote threshold. It forces compromise. I think in the end, that's a good thing for our country. And I think it's always the case, whether Democrats are in power or Republicans. But it is a political football right now, for sure. I think one thing that most Americans may not understand is we talk about bipartisanship a lot because it, you know, is either how you get stuff done or the weapon you use to say we need bipartisanship because this should be a bipartisan (laughs) issue, which is hilarious because some, you know, most of the time it's not. Right, right, Um, of course. But I think people don't realize how much Congress does work right together to that's get right. stuff done just by the nature kind of what you were talking that's about right. of it's the necessary tool to get things that's right. done yeah um so it's important to keep that in mind and even now you know there's bipartisan groups of senators in the senate working on some legislative yeah. reform for the voting. electoral ca- count act yeah, yeah that's right yeah. so lots of different things happening i think yep. you've kind of touched on it it's really important to remember that no party is innocent you no. know, everybody's guilty of saying one thing. <clears throat> I mean, in the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, you know, Mitch McConnell was famous for saying, we're going to get her through because our president nominated her. Absolutely. But when Obama nominated Merrick Garland, That's he right. was like, the people have voted, you know, and <laughs> not saying that anything about Mitch McConnell as a leader, you know, I think That's he's right. a really good leader. He's of a the very, party. Effective very effective leader. Effective, yes. Extraordinarily effective. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, really hard to disprove that he said that because he did. Of course. <laughs> of course he did. So yeah. it's not like it, everyone's innocent, just like you've said. No. Um, so as Christians, you know, it's really easy to leave your Christianity behind when you talk about politics. 
and look in voting rights and say, oh, well, you know, my faith has no application to voting rights. Sure. You know, it's purely right. a legal question. Yeah. I either agree with the law or I don't agree with the law. Uh, but there is a, you know, an aspect of, you know, agency that we've, you know, as a historical idea of yeah. people being, you know, having their own agency to make their own determinations. And how do we as Christians balance our faith, you know, with, you know, balancing what we believe and holding our convictions, but also with respecting the rights that we hold as Americans of other people individually and as a whole? Yeah. I think, first of all, you have to, you know, as Christ tells us, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Mm. And so we should be known for being consistent and Mm. stable and uh, principled. And so we should be willing to say, okay, this is what I believe. I believe it regardless of who's in control, regardless of which party is in control of Congress or the presidency or whatever it may Mm. be, we should be consistent, right? We should just blow with the political winds because that suggests you really – aren't speaking the truth. Um, I think that's a significant issue. But when it comes to particularly voting rights itself, you know, we are commanded, of course, to love our neighbor and to think of them um, on at least equivalent terms of yeah. us. And of course, we're also commanded to love our enemies. And so yeah. even if you think the other party is in this sort of morally inferior position to you and you see them as an enemy, you're commanded to love them. And yeah. so the question then becomes, how do we work that out in this society and this political system that we have right now? If we truly value uh, political input yeah. and if we value voting, which we do as a society, then I think we can make a strong argument. There should be good, solid access for as large of a group of people that's reasonable. And that's part of our value. You know, we're based on the consent of the governed. That's yep. what we say all the time. Yep. That's what the declaration is premised upon. And so we should be willing to fight for equal access to the ballot box. Yeah. We should be willing to stand up for that. And so, you know, it's really not fair if you try to limit certain people's ability to vote. And again, we could argue about what does it mean to limit, yeah. right? And I get that. Uh, you know, requiring universal absentee ballots is not the same thing as saying I'm respecting your right to vote. And so I, I understand the differences and the nuances at work there, but we should want people to be treated equally yeah. and fairly. We should want to see justice yeah. done. And so uh, to think that there are voting regulations in place that unduly diminish a person's ability to vote, that's a problem. And that's yeah. an issue. And we should talk about it in yeah. those terms, not just about what's good for my party or what's not. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, I didn't want this conversation to devolve into you know whether or not election was secure in the 2020 election because that is an entirely different conversation. It is. But it is really what kind of spurred on right, all of, of this recent debate. Yeah. Um, so if you could quickly, I mean, in terms of election integrity, you know, there's a lot we could talk about. But in Ohio, for example, the cases of reported fraud were so insignificant Correct. that, you know, there was hardly any reason. Correct. Uh, and But people yeah. still report things that they saw which were, you know, questionable, like a mom voting for her children and, you know, right. or something like that. Right. Um, so talk about how we as Christians can respond to, you know, somewhat valid arguments that there were issues with the election, but also not devolve into this, you know, social media pointing the finger, you know, just completely descending into chaos kind of argument. So I I think the evidence is overwhelming that the 2020 election was a secure election where the outcome was as reported. Uh, I think the same thing is true of the 2016 election. Same thing is true of 2018. It's going to be true of 2022. And so we don't have significant elements of fraud in our electoral process. Um, We always have instances. We always have miscast votes or some fraud that takes place by an individual who votes more than once, whatever it may be. Uh, But on the whole, it's a very small problem. Uh, and I think we should be willing to speak the truth of that, right? We should be known to speak the truth of yeah. that and say, I understand that it's not politically popular in certain places to say it, uh, but I think the election had integrity. And we should value that. We should seek we should seek integrity, integrity in our electoral yeah. process. Um, and that's certainly something that we can agree on, you'd hope, bipartisan, bipartisan agreement that we want secure elections. Um, and I do understand why people say the 2020 election was different, because it was. It was during a pandemic. There were increased voting opportunities through mail, through drop boxes, through early voting. Some of those increased opportunities were done through executive measures that had been empowered by a legislature. And so people argue that maybe it's illegal or unconstitutional. Those are all good arguments to have. And yeah. courts weighed in on all those arguments yeah. and overwhelmingly said, you know, we're fine with this. Yep. Democratic appointments, Republican appointments yep. were overwhelmingly saying this is OK. And so uh, I get the concern and I understand why some people might argue that there were problems there, but it just doesn't seem like the evidence necessarily supports that. And so. Yeah. I, I, what concerns me as a political scientist is that we have significant portions of our culture that believe our elections are not secure. Yeah. Republicans and Democrats, right? Yep. Democrats still talk about 
uh, the Georgia gubernatorial election mm-hmm. between Kemp and Abrams that yep. supposedly was stolen from Stacey Abrams. She still has never conceded that yep. election. She refuses to concede that election. Um, and so we've all sort of played footsie with this idea at different points. That, oh, this election isn't valid. We've got to get past that. Yeah. This is That's a bad tool to use to stoke support, to get fundraising, to build your profile. It's a bad tool to use. It's not good for the system. Yeah. Maybe good for the party, maybe good for an individual candidate, but not good for the electoral system when people talk like that. Yeah. And so I'm all for ferreting out fraud. I want to make sure that it's a fair and just system. But when it's fair and just, we should say that. Yep. And we should point to uh, when it's not, we should say that as well. And so this is a really hard political environment. Yeah. And people are using all these tools to get advantages on both sides. Yeah. And it's a, it's disturbing. Yeah. Well, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for coming on. Got you like the last minute. If there's anything you want to say, 60 seconds, the floor is all yours. I have devoted my career to studying American government and politics. And I think there's an awful lot to admire about our system of government, mm-hmm. an awful lot to admire about our Constitution. That doesn't mean it's perfect. That doesn't mean there aren't changes. And at different points in our history, there have been problems that I think we've tried to solve. Some solve well, some not so well. But uh, I want people to feel good about their country and their political system. We have a really good political system, uh, and we should acknowledge that. And we should also work to maintain that good system Mm -hmm. over time. The tendency, I think, right now is for both sides to want to tear it down for their own purposes. And uh, there has to be an element of us who are willing to say, you know what? We like our system. Let's try to perpetuate it and fix it as we can. Um, I think we've got to stand firm there. But right now, that's that's a hard thing to do. Well, Dr. Smith, you were the first guest on our first episode for Seer 60. So thank you so much for coming back on to be our first uh, guest for season two. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks a bunch. And I hope to do it again at some point. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, the season two of the Seer 60 podcast. We hope you'll join us as we continue to explore politics from the distinctive lens of the gospel. Uh, we hope you'll uh, follow us on social media, subscribe on all major platforms. And uh, thanks so much. We hope you'll join us next time.